Okay, so this past year you were inducted into the Ashtabula County Football Hall of Fame, right? Yes, sir. Tell me yes. About that. Um, well, first things first, it's, it's not anything, um, if I'm being completely honest with you, it's not anything that you can foresee. Um, it's not, you can't have foresight and say, I'm going to make the Hall of Fame. Um, and to me, I think that's the beauty of it is because I ne it never crossed my mind. Like it was never, uh, it was never even on my radar as something that was achievable, achievable for me. Not because I didn't think I could achieve it, just because you don't set out to play the game to, to make the Hall of Fame. You set out to play the game because you love the game um, and you love everything about the game. So I think, you know, the Hall of Fame for me, was just a culmination of, of doing things the right way um, and people recognizing that you know he's a hard-working kid um, he's got a lot of talent um, but he doesn't just allow his talent to do it so for me making the Hall of Fame I think that's a byproduct of, of really just working hard um, and, and trying trying to do things the right way so the Hall of Fame for me yes you could say it's a culmination of your life's work um, but again you never know you're going to get there so to get there um, extremely humbled um, extremely extremely grateful um, and extremely blessed because you realize once you get into um, an illustrious group like that or, or organization um, like that it's something that no one can ever really take away from you um, it kind of solidifies um, your place as far as Ashtabula County football history is concerned and for me that's that's everything because I put my all into it um, so to know that you know for the rest of my natural life um, I will be mentioned amongst the greats the, to play in Ashtabula County I think it's a wonderful thing but it's not anything I take for granted because I never I never thought that I could be here um, so again when you talk about the moment of it going through it um, for me, it was more about the people that helped me get there. Well, yeah, you had some of your teammates yeah. there with you, right? Yeah, so th like when I first found out um, that I was going into the Hall of Fame, my next calls weren't even to my coaches. My next calls were to my teammates um, because I'm a quarterback. I was a quarterback. So and as a quarterback, I needed 10 people doing their job so that I could be successful. So from a very early age of playing quarterback, I realized like it doesn't really matter how much talent I have. Like, if I don't have guys that are willing to work hard on my behalf, it, it won't matter. Um, but ultimately, I realized, too, that it's about how you treat people. So my teammates were the teammates they were for me because of how I treated them. So um, when I made those calls to my teammates, it was, it was purely first to thank them um, because I felt like it wasn't me going into the Hall of Fame. It was us going into the Hall of Fame. So um, I began my Hall of Fame speech by asking my teammates to stand up just because I realized I wouldn't be standing there giving the speech if it wasn't for the sacrifices and the hard work and dedication that, that, that they put in. Um, and I didn't want to just talk about it. I could have called them, congratulate, or thank them, and and that would have sufficed. So a lot of, uh, most of them would have been great with that. Um, but I, again, I believe in in showing people how you really feel about them. Um, so I knew if I could have them there um, to to share that moment with me, then that would tell them, hey, I really care about you. Um, we really were in this thing together. Um, this is not anything that that I'm receiving on my own. So you might you could say we're all going into the Hall of Fame today because anytime anyone ever speaks to me about the Hall of Fame they're going to hear about you because I couldn't be there without you so um, the Hall of Fame for me is just a combination of, of teamwork um, not really individual work earlier we talked about you talked about the Madison game and you expressed how it was different yeah okay for your teammates but there's also some more that you had uh, expressed to me earlier about some of your emotions and feelings during that game. Do you want to express that again? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the Madison game was a huge game for me um, my senior year because Madison was was undefeated like us. We were both 4-0 teams. Um, we understood that the game, um, from a team standpoint, that game was going to have huge implications um, on us as far as the playoffs is concerned. So we knew it was almost like the first half Super Bowl of our senior year. Um, it was a game we needed to win. So, um, going into the game, you know, Madison has some pretty good players. You know, so quarterback, there's quarterback comparisons, running back comparisons, you know, all those types of things. Um, but the other caveat for me um, was it was going to be the first time that my biological father was going to watch me play. Um, and for any young man, 
um, you would be lying to yourself if you said it didn't matter if your dad was there watching you. It matters to every young man, whether you're the best player on your team or you're a guy that doesn't play that much. It's a big deal to have your father there to watch you. So it was a big deal for me um, to have my dad there. But because our relationship was strained, really, because he wasn't around um, when I was when I was growing up, um, the emotional aspect of it was a little different than you would think um you would think it would be happiness um you would think it would be a joyful um experience and it was from the football aspect but as soon as i wasn't on the field um and i i was faced with you know seeing my dad i was faced with you know um <clears throat> you know my dad being able to 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 say hey you know, Olajuwon Cooper, number seven, the quarterback, that's my son. Um, and me knowing deep down in my heart that <clears throat> he hadn't necessarily been there like that and taken, you know, responsibility like he should have, um, that was disheartening to me. Um, because I felt like it was more of a, you know, I'm going to become a little bit more relevant or I'm going to become a little bit more significant because I'm able to say that my son is Olajuwon Cooper and no one there knew that he was never around. Um, so it just appeared that my dad was there and, you know, everything was good. Um, but, he, you know, underneath things really weren't good. Um, so it wasn't the traditional um, father son embrace after the game. It was more of a conversation. Um, because I didn't know him really, and he didn't really know me. Um, so emotionally, <clears throat> that that stirred you up a bit. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because you, the the jubilation from winning the game, and, and knowing that we just beat a pretty good team that that's probably going to give us a lot of points um, towards the playoffs. So you got that jubilation um, of wanting to celebrate with my teammates, my coaches, everybody that 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 put into to us being successful. And then there's this other real life situation that I got to face right now because my dad's right here in front of me. Um, so it was definitely um, a wide range of emotions in a short period of time. Um, and again, at this time, I'm 17 years old. Um, if you understand young men, you understand the prefrontal cortex, decision making, all those types of things. Um, it was just tough, like, you know, to really, like, embrace that moment. Um, but looking back on it, I think it's a powerful thing because I definitely know I'm not the only young man that's faced a situation like that. So, again, me making it a part of, of, the, of the documentary is, again, really not to really divulge my personal information, but more or less um, to help another young man that may have experienced the same thing um, as far as, you know, giving their, their parent a, a, a fair opportunity. So, um, going forward after that game, um, we tried as best we could to, you know, to make it better and things of that nature. And um, I would say it got better in comparison to what it was. Um, but it was a lot to take in that in that moment um, just because again I think I had the jubilation of winning the game and, and being the starting quarterback and and really playing a good game um, I had one incompletion that game and two touchdown passes so I played a really good game um, but then have the emotional aspect of having my dad there was kind of you know and, and again in that moment you don't have anybody to confide in to say like this is what's going on um, it's almost like I had to play a part too like almost like an actor per se um, which again was disheartening for me um, just because at that point in my life I, I had I had enough real relationships in my life um, to, to be a little bit upset about you know someone trying to materialize a fake one okay well you've talked about <clears throat> some of your family relationships do you want to expound on that at all your family your yeah. grandmother yeah and, and and you know yeah I mean you mentioned before about the religion and the faith but if you want to talk more about that let's hear it yeah absolutely when you uh and even you know speaking about the situation with with my father coming to to the game um I would say even how I handled that situation was a lot based on um, my upbringing and, and how my great-grandmother raised me um no matter what happened Parentally for me, my great-grandmother always told me that uh, your parents are your parents and if uh, your parents didn't get together There would be no you so she essentially told me from the time I was real young that it, it, it almost don't matter what they do not excusing it, but You're going to be respectful. You're going to be polite um, And you're going to have reverence for them because they are the reason that you're here so 
you may not like some of the things they do in their own lives, um, but again, that's not your call. So that was a powerful life lesson for me because I can honestly say that if that wasn't instilled in me, I definitely would have harbored bad thoughts, bad feelings, um, all those types of things about my parents because, you know, that was that's a natural reaction when someone is not there the way they should be there for you. So thank God for my great grandmother, um, Hester Jackson, because she instilled a lot of those things in me. And I believe, obviously, she was smart enough to know that, hey, on the inside, you may be hurting on the inside. You may be having these these feelings, these things that that overtake you from time to time. Um, but I just want you to know that you know you're still going to be a great young man you're still going to be well-mannered you're still going to be polite despite those things so i'm forever grateful um for my great grandmother for instilling things like that in me because it really helped me navigate some tough situations as a young man um the other you know person that stepped in in my life um is my mom pumpkin um she's not my biological mother um, my biological mother did a great job. She did the best she could do based on, you know, the circumstances and the situation. Um, but I actually had another family member step up um, and, and take take on that motherly role for me. And I can honestly say a lot of the the uh, characteristics that I possess today, a lot of the mannerisms that I possess today, come from um, being in an environment with, uh, I guess you would call her my stepmother, um, where I had standards. Um, it was the first time in my life I had expectations, and those expectations weren't sports related. Those expectations were academically related. Um, and I had some academic, you know, hardships um, throughout high school, throughout college. Um, but it was those life lessons about academics that were instilled in me when I was younger that propelled me and made me not stop when I had these failures academically. So I can honestly say that, you know, if it wasn't for my mom, Pumpkin, um, not only you know providing the environment that was conducive to me being successful but she also lived the life in front of me that showed me um i don't just talk about these things like i live these things myself so having you know a mom that that has you know an education that has a bachelor's degree um at before that i didn't i had aspirations to go to college but they were purely athletic aspirations um once she took over when I was a freshman, um, I actually moved in into her house. Um, the expectation and things changed just because there were standards. Um, there were things that I had to do um, and not just had to do for her, but these were things that I needed to do in order to be successful later on in life. Um, so pretty much like laying the, the, the foundation um, for who Olajuwon Cooper could become um, and for that I'm forever grateful because without the foundation without her you know instilling and instructing those things and then living the life in front of me I really don't think I would be sitting here right now having this conversation um, because again for me seeing is believing I believe what I see so based on how she lived I started to believe that academics could really do some stuff for me up to up into that point as a african-american young man I can be honest in saying I only seen african-american African-American men be successful playing sports um, or being, you know, some type of entertainer. Um, very rarely do I remember as a kid coming across, you know, seeing an African-American doctor on TV or hearing about African-American doctors or hearing about African-American politicians, presidents, anything of that nature. So you kind of grow up thinking that those things aren't necessarily for you because you don't see anyone that looks like you doing those things. Um, so I can honestly say she, she, she started the belief system in me to believe that I could do some of these things despite not necessarily seeing anybody that may look like me doing those things. Um, I wouldn't say it was a trailblazer situation because it wasn't proposed to me to do these things so that I could be the first. It was just really proposed to do these things so that you would have a chance really so that I would have a chance to really um, um, do some things. I also had some uncles. Um, I have an uncle that's a pastor now um, that's always been um, kind of on the straight and narrow path. Um, so he's always been someone I could look at. I remember, uh, you know, just as, as an example, and this may not mean a lot to, to, to anyone else, but it meant a lot to me that when I got to college and I was going to get my first car, um, I didn't have credit. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't even understand credit or anything like that. Um, but my uncle was a guy who I could call and he was going to be um, a co-signer. Um, on my first vehicle 
And for me as an African American young man who doesn't understand credit, who doesn't understand, you know, taking care of money, saving money, anything like that, um, to have somebody in position that has credit and that could explain to me how credit works and how it's going to be so much more beneficial um, as an adult to have good credit, um, I'm forever grateful because again, without his knowledge and, and tutelage as far as being in position to do those things, I would have never, ever, ever probably known how to do those things. Um, so my naiveness really opened up an opportunity for my uncle to be elevated in my life because he had some things and he had done some things, again, on the right on the right accord um, to kind of show that, hey, these things are possible. You can do some stuff. Um, you may come from, you know, um, some adversity, some hardships, but that doesn't have to define you. It, has, it doesn't have to be the end all or be all. So um, I definitely had some people in my life and I, I, I guess you could say, um, not biologically connected to me, um, but right now, um, I have two moms that you can't tell me they're not my mom, um, and that's a, a, a woman by the name of Cheryl Johnson, um, and a woman by the name of, of Joan Billman. Now, first about Cheryl Johnson, Cheryl Johnson was the membership director at the YMCA, and when I was a kid, I couldn't afford a, a membership to the YMCA. Um, there also was a guy at the YMCA named Larry Mazzacco, um, who ran the gym upstairs. So, um, when I was a kid, the only way I could go to the Y is if I went with somebody that had a membership. Um, so eventually, my love for sports grew so much that I didn't always have people to go with. So eventually, you know, I tried the, the typical um, stuff that any young kid, I feel like any young kid would try is, okay, there's a bunch of people at the front desk, they're talking to the people at the front desk, hey, you just try and walk by and hope nobody stops you um, while you're walking by. So fortunate for me, one day she stopped me. Um, and I guess you could say the rest is history. Um, and I can remember um, between her and Mr. Mazako, and this is not out in them or anything like that. This is them giving a young man an opportunity to go to a, a safe place um, because they understood Station Avenue was no place, you know, safe for a young man. Um, so I remember, like, you know, you would have the YMCA card that you'd have to show at the front desk. Um, I remember Mr. Mazako gave me one of his business cards and then my mom Cheryl laminated it and on the back of the his business card it said please allow Elijah Cooper into the YMCA so that was my YMCA card um, so I guess you could say for me as a young kid to have people be that selfless that don't know me that don't have any type of biological biological connection I can honestly say that's why I am the way I am today um, because a lot of people went out of their way to make sure um, I could do things that just naturally I wasn't in position to do so when I think about my mom Cheryl um, and I'm talking like integrated me into her family with her two kids her husband like you know when I was at the Y it was hey my mom Cheryl is going to take care of everything I need taken care of if my my great-grandmother um, would call up to the Y and hey he's not coming to the Y or hey he's she would support those things um, so she became um, a part of my family as well um, so she's great and like I said today she's Mama Cheryl um, we have conversations now she is always talking about you know how I make her proud but for me it's she doesn't realize what she did for me um, and you could she you know tries to tell me about I seen potential in you I loved you genuinely um, but to me, it's something totally different. The fact that she went through it and it never stopped. And the fact that I'm 36 years old today and she's still my mama Cheryl. She still wishes me happy birthday. She still sends me Christmas cards, like all those things. So, um, and then when I think about Joan Billman, Joan Billman um, is, the hub, uh, is, is the wife of, of Robert Billman um, or Bob Billman. And they own um, Billman. Um, funeral homes right on the corner of, of Route 20. Um, now it's called Fleming and Billman Funeral Home. But as a kid, um, I befriended um, their oldest son, Chris. Um, and once I befriended Chris, because Chris went to Thurgood Marshall just like me, um, it kind of turned into a real life family situation where the other two boys, um, the other two sons, Chris and Nick, didn't have to be home for me to be at the house um, so it literally turned into I'm the middle brother um, there's a uh, we took family photos I just actually shared um, as a memory on my Facebook probably last week our family photo of just me Nick and Chris um, so it was that 
um, we were that in tech. My uh, my second college visit to Miami of Ohio, they took me to that. Um, so when you talk about family, um, you talk about the things that I may have lacked because I didn't have, you know, a mother and, and a father come up in the traditional family. Um, they showed me those things. Um, and not only did they, did they show me those things, they made me a part of those things. Um, so the the man I am, the uh, the dad I am, um, how I treat women, all that stuff stems from being in an environment with them that showed how you really do those things. Um, and again, today, 36 years old, Mama Billman, I could go to their house, they send me, it's the same. Like, nothing's ever changed. Um, and because nothing's ever changed, it kind of speaks to me, to the genuineness of what they were doing when I was younger. Um, the fact that, again, it's Mama Billman, Mama Cheryl, and my family is now their family. My wife talks to Mama Cheryl and Mama Billman. Like, you know what I mean? So for me, um, I guess you could say my family is, is gigantic just because I had a lot of people pour into me and there's more. Um, and I just don't want to leave anybody out or keep going just because I probably would leave somebody out. Um, but those, those ones that I named, they definitely played an integral role um, in me being who I am. Um, so when you talk about some of the things I do in football right now as a head coach, um, yes, you could probably view some of those things as going out of my way, but I don't just because that's what someone did for me. Um, and I know what it did for me. So because I understand what it did for me, I know the impact it can have on my players because I know it happened for me. <clears throat> okay, that's great.